Okay, um, good morning everybody and welcome to this uh, APSI Energy and Consultation Institute webinar. You can see there's the uh, the agenda on the screen there for the next uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for those who don't know me, know me my name is Phil Brennan, I'm head of APSI Energy and I've got uh, Charlotte Banks and Louise, um, Louise Midwood here in the office to uh, help out with what we're, what we're doing today and uh, Davy Jones um, is with us virtually. Um, they'll be speaking. will be speaking a bit later. We've got another couple of speakers as well. Um, but for the, for the time being, we're just going to concentrate on. Um, just move to the next slide. Just going to concentrate on what will be uh, a document and an exercise that we've been through uh, with the consultation institute, which is um, which will result in the, uh, the document that you see on your screen. <clears throat> so you'll know that we've run a series of these events over the past uh, well since covid has been has been going and we know they're of interest to to you guys on the basis of the numbers that we're getting attending today's is a little bit different as i say but we're, we're running an association with the consultation institute on the topic of local authority engagement and uh, the climate emergency we've run um a joint survey which some of you will have responded to and we're publishing this document uh, over the next week or so um you'll be sent a copy of it and we're talking about the, the, the process that we've been through and the documents here today. <clears throat> Following that, we've got uh, a couple of presentations on the same topic from Durham and, and Derbyshire. For those who are consultation institute members, but not APSI Energy Institute members, uh, sorry, APSI Energy members, I'll just give a 30 second um, introduction to what APSI does. So we are a not for profit local association exists purely to advise and support local authorities across the UK been around for over 30 years across all services and all political uh, affiliations. We've got about 260 local authorities who are members and we tell the rest of the councils as non-members. Our focus is on operational services as well as corporate matters and one of the aim or one of our aims is the councils retain a core capacity to undertake its main services rather than outsourcing them and breaking that link with direct control by the council. We set up APSI Energy about six years ago as a bespoke service for all things energy, climate and sustainability related. And we are here to keep officers and members up to date with the changes in this dynamic area that we all work in. If your local authority isn't a member, then it should be. But we don't want to do, don't want to do a big sales pitch here, so if you're interested in that, just get in touch with us after, after this uh, webinar. In terms of the practicalities, we're going to be here for about an hour and a, an hour and a half. Um, got three speakers after you've heard from myself and some time for questions and answers and comments and your own authorities. So please keep your uh, cameras off, that helps with the uh, bandwidth and your microphones on mute unless you are speaking later of course. Um, I'd encourage you to make comments through the chat function to ask questions and we'll pick them up um, after the speaker has spoken. Uh, you may see the record icon is showing on your screen, don't worry about that. That's only for the speakers, you will be recorded, so if you're still in your pyjamas, no problem. <laughs> All the slides are going to be available after the event uh, on our website and we'll send you to them, send them to you, so don't worry about that either. Um, if your screen freezes and uh, you know your, the slides don't appear to be moving on as they should be, just try leaving the meeting uh, and rejoining again using the original link. Um, if most people are able to, to follow the slides and, it, and it's okay for most people, then really it's a problem at your end, there's not much we can do about that. So I suggest leaving and coming back. Um, so I've just got a few slides I want, I want, I want to go through. Um, so if you just move on the release, please. Yeah, uh, next one. Get the volume lower. Mm. Okay, so. Take it down, sir. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, uh, you know, climate emergency is a big deal. It's it's going to be with us uh, for an awful long time, and councils have got a, a big role to play in it. You know, both from their own side, their own operational side, um, as well as uh, the leadership side, informing and educating citizens, those people who spend time in your area, businesses, other partners, you know, public and pharmacy sectors too. It's that leadership role that we talk about. You know, influencing, nudging, communicating, regulating. Although local authorities are producing one, two, maximum three percent of the emissions in their area, uh, you know, there's obviously still that big role to play. Back here at the moment, the survey that we carried out, um, and which the document refers to, 
uh, and the results from it and the responses to that were people like you. So interested, informed about the agenda, uh, working on it on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, you're obviously an important and influential audience, but you're not the only audience. <clears throat> so just going to refer back to a survey that we carry out every year through Servation. It's about a range of topics in terms of local authorities. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please, Louise. <coughs> uh, it's, a, it's a representative survey. We carried it out in, in October. Uh, it's gone. Um, around about 1,700 people, including booster samples from Northern Ireland and Wales, so we ensure a subsample of at least 100 people in those regions. Just going to look at a few relevant graphs from it. Um, here, as you can see, 70% of people think their local community will need to respond to climate change. So in other words, you know, <clears throat> it's not just about the formal groups, it's not just about the authorities, people understand that there's a, a role for them as well. Uh, next one, please. Uh, yeah, 54% uh, are supporting more funds for councils to do to carry out their goal. Um, this is down 12% on last year. It's an annual survey that we carry out, probably caused by COVID-19, creating you know, a need for other health and economic priorities and a response to those as well. But point is, over half of people think that extra funding should be spent locally. Uh, next one. Yeah, in terms of in terms of priorities, um, and and uh, extra funds in there, and what should that extra funds funds be spent on? Obviously, the social care issue is a massive issue, and there's other issues there that, that you can see which people have got different priorities on. But in terms of this public opinion survey, local climate change action is there second, along with road maintenance and affordable housing. So people obviously think it's a it's a vital issue in terms of the local authority context. So just some highlights from survey, as I said, the surveys, the slides will be available afterwards. Um, just let me just remind me of something on the next slide, please, Louise. Yeah, yeah, OK, so I'm just referring to something here from um, and, and those who listened to Chris Stark from the Committee on Climate Change last week when they launched their sixth carbon budget um, will or may remember that he spoke about the climate assembly that was engaged uh, as part of drawing up that report and its findings <clears throat> and he mentioned that at the start of the process he was a bit skeptical really you know maybe about the decisions that an uninformed group were going to make nonetheless you know they uh, the climate assembly went ahead and he, he, his comment was that uh, they were the members of that assembly were supportive when it came to information that was sorry when when they were receiving the information when the, you know, the, the position was explained to them, the data was, was provided to them. Around issues, the issues that people think are the most difficult, really, behaviour change, you know, less flying, uh, changes in diet, those kind of personal issues. <clears throat> he said that people want to be involved in policy development, um, as well as uh, the fact that um, the, the outcomes from the groups, from the individuals and from the assembly uh, that they came up with were very similar to the approach that you would use on a, a numbers based approach. So which, you know, that, I found that particularly interesting. Uh, you look at all the evidence and you come to a certain conclusion and you ask people who are, who are, you know, pass that evidence to and they come to the same conclusion as well. So for those who haven't got involved in um, climate system, climate assemblies, uh, juries, the, the physical engagement. You know you've got to do it, it's got to be around. Um, it is helpful, uh, don't be afraid of it. Others are up to it, so you know, there's others that you can learn from as well. Um, and some of the results that we've just seen there give the impression that we are you know, pushing at an open door, so as you could say. <clears throat> um, and that, that should come out in our engagement activities. Okay, that's just a bit of context uh, to start with. Um, I'm going to pass you over to David Jones now, who's an associate from the Consultation Institute. Uh, as I said, put comments on the chat as we're going along and ask questions, um, and we'll come to them in a moment. OK, David, if you want to unmute your, unmute your microphone, over to you and we can, we can get going. Thanks, Phil. Um, and I'd just like to thank Phil and also Louise and Charlotte from Apsi Energy for all the work they've done on this survey and the report. It's been a pleasure working with them. And uh, although it's got my name on this slide, 
I'd also just like to mention that none of this would have been possible, this survey or this um, report, if I hadn't also had the support of Sheena Ahmed, um, Penny Norton, Emma Wilson and Howard Kendall at the Consultation Institute. So I wanted to start by looking at the issue of engagement on the climate emergency. Um, some of these points are sort of obvious, but I think they're really worth stressing right from the beginning. First of all, because the climate emergency is something that's going to be with us for 15, 20 years or even more, this is a long term process of engagement that we have to carry out. And this is unusual. It's not normal for local authorities to have to continue to engage people on one particular topic for this sort of length of time. This is a new uh, problem or issue for us all to work out how best to do that. So this is a continuous process and it's going to change. We can't tell how we're going to engage people in 10 years time, but we know that we're going to have to plan to be able to do that and to have the capacity to do that throughout this whole process. Other points are that this really does have to be integrated into all the other work and the other engagement work that you do as local authorities. Uh, it's very important that when you're engaging people on other topics, the integration of climate, the climate emergency and how we're going to react to that, how we're going to respond to that is built in to the other work that you're doing, particularly around any form of public engagement. It's a basic sort of thing, I know, but good, interesting information and communication. We'll come back to this later on, but it's absolutely essential that if people are going to be engaged and consulted about the climate emergency, that they have access to sufficient good quality information that they can realistically engage in the process and make choices. It has to be also a two way process. You know, um, we don't start from a blank sheet of paper. We start from a situation where lots of people uh, in local areas are at best begrudging uh, and at worst downright cynical about being engaged or being consulted on different issues. There's a lack of trust. It's not as bad as it is with national politicians, but certainly even at the local level, there's a certain degree of, well, I don't know, we've been asked before, people didn't always listen, that type of thing. You have to overcome that. So you've got to make it a real, a, a genuine process of engagement that you really do intend to listen to what people say. You've got to make it real as well. Um, you know, uh, there was an LGA report just came out just, I think, two days ago which said that 80% of councils now have suffered climate related incidents in the last five years. This isn't something happening elsewhere. This is something that's affecting us now. And you've got to use the expertise and knowledge and ideas from the public. You know, we don't engage just for to tick a box. It's because actually the public are going to have lots of thoughts on this and lots of good ideas. And we need to build on that and to use that. And this is going to involve a whole range of different techniques. And we'll come on to some of those maybe later on, and one of which is going to be consultations. And so just looking then at the issue of consultation on the on the, uh, the, the Institute describes this as follows. This is our sort of formal. Um, maybe we could just go back. Yeah, um, this is our sort of formal definition of, of consultation. And the, the central point of this is, is a dynamic process of dialogue. It's a genuine exchange of views. And the idea is that it's going to give people the real say on influencing decisions, policies or programmes of actions. And that's why we think it's such an important technique within all the range of techniques which you have for engaging local people. So I'm now going to look at different key points that came out of the survey results after we talked to people. The first one is that although almost all of the respondents to the survey said that they declared a climate emergency or a similar type of strong public commitment on this, less than half of them could confirm that they actually had a climate engagement strategy. And this might seem a sort of pernickety point, but it's not really. Um, as part of your action plans for delivering your climate emergency or for delivering your other strong public commitments around, uh, around climate change, you've got to have a climate engagement strategy as well a long term plan for how you're going to consistently keep people involved, uh, informed and having a say on how this whole process develops over time. So that's the first point from the climate uh, from from the survey. Moving on to the second point, um, this is about the communication issue. It was interesting, the responses from local authorities about what they've done so far to date. Um, 
And generally speaking, obviously there were some exceptions, but generally speaking, most of what local authorities reported to us, you would really accurately describe as communication, like material on their website, social media, briefings, and so on, rather than engagement. And that still remained true for future activity, but there was a lot more emphasis on what people plan to do in the future on using specific engagement techniques. And Phil mentioned things like uh, citizens assemblies and juries, but other things like polls, forums, focus groups, and all the rest. I think this is very important. Top-down communication is simply not going to work on climate change, and we'll come back maybe to that point in a moment. Moving on to the third key point, um, local authorities said that, you know, uh, when they were asked about who their main audiences were, we were very encouraged by the fact that the vast majority of them said it was as many as people as possible within the local area, or they referred to it as, as residents. That's important. Uh, and we've actually had some experience of this, haven't we, over the last um, last month or two. Local authorities were given money by the government to rapidly introduce new traffic calming measures. And lots of local authorities did that quite rightly. And it was difficult for them to find the time often to consult local people properly about it. But the result was in lots of areas, a serious backlash against introducing these measures. And often the main thing that people said was, we weren't consulted. And that's a problem, isn't it? Um, although it can always seem like, oh, it's delaying things, it's a slow process to ask people what they think about things, actually provoking a backlash can cause even greater delays. And you know what? On the climate emergency, the last thing we need are big delays because we've created a backlash. From the very beginning, you've got to try to get people on your side. It was, it was interesting as well in the survey that young people were rightly mentioned as a key a key group of people to be consulted and discussed with over the climate emergency. There was less emphasis on the other equalities groups. And I think it's just worth noting that some of the equalities groups are precisely the people who will be most adversely affected by the climate emergency. So it's going to be very important that they are thoroughly engaged in the process too. Moving on to the next key point um, from the survey uh, results. This one will come as no great surprise, and, and Phil alluded to this earlier. When we ask people, what's the biggest external barrier to doing this work? Uh, overwhelmingly, the, the, the most significant one was a lack of national government commitment. And to be honest, whether you think that's true or not isn't really the point. If it's the perception of local authorities that that is a major barrier, then it is a, a major barrier. It's very demotivating to feel that you're trying to tackle something and the national government isn't fully committed to this agenda. Also mentioned was apathy of the public by quite a lot of people. It's unclear why people suggested that. Certainly opinion polls are still suggesting and, uh, and showing that the climate emergency is still a very key issue for lots of people locally. So that was an interesting point. We'd like to delve into that more perhaps in future, in, in future surveys. Moving on to the next point, uh, which came out of the survey. Again, this will probably come as no huge surprise. We asked people, what's the biggest internal barrier to you carrying out work on the climate engagement? And again, what came back was a lack of money and the financial effects, the financial impact, if you like, of COVID-19, making the lack of money even worse. And you don't need me to tell you that local authorities have suffered incredibly severe cuts to their budgets over the last decade, 50% in the case of lots of local authorities, which is an extraordinary amount. Um, and so it's not surprising that local authorities are struggling to find the resources for this. And it, engaging the public can be expensive at the best of times, but especially if you're trying to do this on a long term complex issue such as the climate emergency. So actually cracking the issue about where do you find the money to be able to do this, this vital work so that you do engage people and it doesn't undermine you uh, because people feel they haven't been involved. That, that's a really important issue for local authorities uh, to come to terms with. It's worth just quoting this, mentioning this last quote that we had from, from one of our respondents saying, I don't believe we've even set a budget, never mind changed it. Um, certainly, there was a lot of, uh, of, of worry about the whole money side of things when it came to doing this work. Just moving on then to the next, uh, next key point. Um, we asked local authorities, what would they most benefit from? on engaging the public on the climate emergency. And what came up was 
good practice examples and case studies. Hence, two good case studies on this webinar today. Uh, and, and workshops and webinars to exchange this good practice. We got the impression that lots of local authorities were, uh, were slightly at the sense of not quite knowing where to start or how to start this. It was such a big issue, such a big long-term process that some of them, you just got the sense from the survey responses that they weren't quite sure how on earth to jump in. Uh, the other most cited options for people that, that they felt would be helpful were e-learning for staff and general mm -hmm. guidance on public and stakeholder engagement. And, and without over-egging the, uh, the promotion side of it, both the Consultation Institute and APSI can help you uh, with this work, both with case studies, good practice uh, and guidance on public and stakeholder engagement. Finally, just moving on to, we did a little summary in the report on 10 key things that you can do now on the climate engagement. And uh, this is like a shortened version of the 10 points that we have in, in more detail in the report. First of all, I think it's very important that every local authority starts with a bold public commitment that they're going to engage and consult mm -hmm. local people on the climate emergency. A lot of the local authorities have already done that, and that's great. If you haven't, I think it's important that you do, but it's got to be real. It's got to be a genuine public commitment. It's worse to make a public commitment to engage and then not do it uh, than to keep quiet about it, but a genuine public commitment publicly to do this. Secondly, I think it's very important that you start off well on this. Uh, you want to have early on in the process something which is both interesting, exciting, gets a lot of publicity locally, and which people see in practice that you're listening to them and you're giving them a real say over the agenda. That's why things like, and I'm not suggesting that everyone should do a climate assembly or a climate jury or something like that, but something like that, which gets a bit of publicity and which shows that you're really listening. I think that's very important um, uh, from the outset. Uh, what you don't want to be is on the back foot from the start of people saying that you're not serious about it. I mentioned earlier about good quality educational material um, and also what the council is doing about it. You can't expect people to get involved if they have no idea what's already happening or why they have to take action on this issue. Make it real. Um, show how it's affecting your local community and your local people. We were recently on a discussion with a local authority where um, the, uh, the officer said to us, we don't talk about polar bears and, and, and the Arctic. What we talk about is flooding, air pollution. And, you know, just, just uh, yesterday, a coroner in London found that uh, a young black child had died partly as a result of air pollution in that local area. This is now going to be a really big issue uh, from now on, if it isn't already for local authorities. You can show how these changes are drastically, dramatically affecting your local community already. And that's why mm -hmm. people respond. Mm -hmm. Make sure your climate emergency plan includes a long-term engagement strategy. I've referred to that already. Use the positive messaging about all this. You know, there's a danger of us always posing this as we've got to make sacrifices. You've got to terrible things we've got to stop doing. Actually, you know, it will be a better quality of life for the vast majority of people if we make the sorts of changes that we need to make. And you know, briefly, for the first month or so of the first lockdown, we noticed that you'd meet people in the street saying how nice it is to be able to hear birds singing again, how nice it is to have less air pollution, less traffic in the area. These, these types of things can all actually help to make people think that this is, these are changes worth making. Making sure that your economic recovery and, and climate change uh, things go hand in hand. You really don't want to end up economic recovery with climate change. There is the real possibility of building back in a different way uh, from COVID-19 and tackling climate change and the economic recovery at the same time. And it was quite encouraging from the survey that a lot of local authorities said that there were, that the economic recovery team and the climate change team were working closely together. Working across the the council and with your other partners in the area is important for local action. This isn't just about the council. Um, this is also about all the other public agencies, the health bodies, public health, health bodies should be involved in this as well. Using different engagement techniques at different times. Um, you know, you're going to have to, if you don't already know all the different types of techniques that you need to use around public engagement, you're going to have to learn them because at different times over the next 10 to 15 years, 
probably all of these different techniques are going to come in useful for you at different times. Things like participatory budgeting, citizens, juries and so on. And finally, a, another plug, we can help. Um, uh, we can help in, from the Consultation Institute, we can help from APSI Energy. And so hopefully this, this survey and the results of this survey and the report will be useful to you. Um, and hopefully we can continue to collaborate together in the future. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, JV. Uh, good insights there and, and, and good to, uh, to look at kind of some of those issues beyond the, the facts and figures from the from the uh, from the responses to the survey. Um, just to, to reiterate the point that, you know, the audience for that survey and the people that gave responses were people like, you know, energy managers, climate change officers, sustainability officer, those kind of people from uh, local authorities like yourselves. So obviously kind of an informed uh, response, if you like. The, the document itself will, uh, as I say, be coming out in a little while. If there are any comments or questions, we've got some time for that. I realise you probably want to have a look at the document um, in order to kind of look at the detail really and come up with or get in touch with us if, if you have got any, any questions or, or comments on it. But um, if you want to put them in the chat, we can either uh, raise them now. We haven't got anything at the moment, but we can. We, if you want to put them in the chat, we can look, come back to them at the end of the uh, at the end of the session. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, <clears throat> just want to look now at a couple of uh, case studies in terms of engagement and hear from what others have done. Uh, or are in the middle of doing. Um, they are just two examples uh, from Durham and Derbyshire. You know, there are a number of others around. You'll, you'll know that some of the uh, some of those have got a bit more publicity. These are two that uh, we thought were particularly interesting, a little bit, little bit uh, different, if you like. Um, so we've got uh, well, we've got about an hour or so to, to go through these and to talk about them afterwards. So again, if you've got any questions coming along, please uh, please raise them. Uh, first of all, we're going to hear from Stephen MacDonald uh, from Drum, Drum Council. Uh, so, Steve, if you just want to un unmute your microphone and we'll start. And a musical introduction as well, thank you. Um, yeah, so th thank you very much. Um, I'll say my name is Stephen MacDonald. I'm the Principal Officer in the Low Carbon Economy Team at Durham County Council. I think it's probably a little bit important to set a little bit of context in terms of the progress of our team. Um, we've been together since 2009, since local government review um, mandated that the seven districts came into one unitary authority at Durham. Um, and since then, you know, we have been working on climate change projects. You know, it wasn't just the declaration of a climate emergency that precipitated the creation of a new team, which I know a lot of local authorities are actually undergo undergoing that process now. You know, so we have been working on it, but I think one of the the key issues is that, you know, we were rubbish at communication. You know, rubbish at awareness raising, rubbish at communications. I make no bones about that. Um, you know, so it, it it is. This was a new direction for us. We hadn't really done any, um, you know, big publicity, big communication drive uh, previous to this. So it, it was a bit of a sort of voyage into the unknown for us. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So this was our timeline. Um, so in February 2019, we declared a climate emergency. Um, that was declared first. There was no, it was a uh, political statement. There was no consultation with our team, um, no consultation on the targets. Um, so at that time in February 2019, uh, the politicians declared that we would be, um, that the council would be 6% uh, better in 2030 than um, uh, 2008-9 baseline. That's what our initial target was. In July 2019, we had to re um, uh, develop a report basically, which was more or less the action plan. Uh, so in six months, we developed the action plan, um, submitted it to council. They then suggested that we go out to consultation, um, which we did. We did a six week consultation in September and following that consultation, we um, 
we worked the action plan and delivered the climate emergency response plan that we are now working to a year later in February 2020. Uh, next slide, please. So we're following the consultation and following the um, the cabinet meeting in February 2019, politicians amended the target uh, to an 8% reduction by 2030. Um, there was an also a, an additional target um, in that we were to investigate what actions are necessary to make carbon neutral by 2050. Um, so we've got two targets there essentially. So we've got the council target, 8% by 2030, and a county-wide target that sort of links into the the, the national picture. Because really, the, the, it is important, I think, to have that um, the, the the national the, the county-wide target there as well. Um, but we can't really go further ahead than what the national what the national target is. I think that's I think that's quite important. I think difficult to make promises that are led by national policy. Uh, next slide please. So in terms of the consultation which is what we're what we're here for, um, as I mentioned yes it was a political decision to consult. Um, it was six weeks which included um, a big big range of different events and um, surveys and obviously this was before Covid <laughs> I have to say. Uh, so it makes things a lot a lot easier. Um, so we did public and staff online surveys, we did elected member surveys, meetings and presentations both um, in, internally with tier four managers and um, staff at the front line. We had meetings with area action partnerships and they're the sort of partnership groups that go out to the public and that have um, ongoing relationships with sort of um, community groups in so I think we've got um I think we've got eleven area action partnerships that cover across County Durham and obviously County Durham's quite a large county, um quite rural. So the, the, the you know and and contrasting, you know, parts of it very rural, parts of it quite affluent, parts of it very deprived, you know, so we, we did try and work with all these different areas to try and get communication out to all these different groups. We work with town and parish councils. We also met with the likes of Extinction Rebellion um, and local pressure groups, the likes of uh, Durham Roadblock. Uh, important to meet with those groups, um, you know, uh, in terms of transparency. Durham, Durham Roadblock had, had, we were going through the local plan process at the same time, which was a bit of a distraction. Um, you know, and, and within our local plan, we had two relief roads which sort of you know went against what we were trying to see in our climate emergency response plan. Um, you know, so we had to meet with them and 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 and, and talk about the, the relationship between the local plan and our climate emergency. Um, yeah, I won't go any further into the into the into the roads issue. Well, suffice to say that actually the local plan has just been approved and the roads have been taken out. Um, maybe a victory for the uh, for the local groups there. Um, we also did significant young persons engagement, um, stakeholder engagement, and um, social media was absolutely essential in all, in all of this. You know, communications engagement, social media, absolutely essential. Next slide, please. So just delving a little bit deeper into the young persons consultation. Now we had a, an officer, he should have been here today unfortunately, but he, he was he was double booked uh, Rich Hurst. Um, and um, he really drives all the young people's consultation for us. So a little bit of sort of history on our relationship um on our activities with sort of with with young with young people we've got a Durham Council's got a really really strong history of support in schools young people with sustainability activity we've been funding um, um a, a one way or the, or the other a schools carbon reduction program since about 2010 um 
it's just been rebranded now and to, well, so a couple of years ago to the Equal to Smart Schools program. And this works right across the county, working with approximately 240 schools through uh, our service level agreement. So, all, so the schools that do sign up to our service level agreement, they pay a little bit more on top of the sort of energy and gas usage. Um, and, that, and that's to pay for this delivery of um, educational support and also it, it, it gives them a bit more support in terms of the energy and um, energy and water analysis as well. Um, and they get the you know other benefits um, you know um, from being part of a wide network of of schools focusing upon sort of the energy issues. Um, yeah, and 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 protect the environment was identified you know from an from an early early stage in, in 2019 by young young people um, you know through the through the uh, make your mark survey. So we knew it was you know it's a big big issue with young people in County Durham. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the actual consultation that we did with young people, um, we used a range of techniques. Um, Obviously, at the at the time there was the school's climate strikes going on, so we met with them on a climate strike day. Um, we got uh, primary schools along, we got secondary schools along, um, all together working with around about 27 schools. We had a children and families partnership event um, in the secondary schools with pupils and senior DC staff um, and counsellors, so they were there to answer questions. Um, at a you know big engagement event, so you know yeah overall that that engaged about 450 pupils and students. So th the highlights from that session from from those sessions were that you know, young people in the county are reasonably well educated on climate on on, on climate emergency. Um, you know they highlighted simple behavior techniques you know switching off lights turn down heat and walking and cycling and things like that they wanted more renewable energy generation in home um, and in and in schools and in, in their communities there was a big expectation that the society would move towards more electric cars and buses and lorries and things like that um, and what they could do more in terms of walking and cycling and scooting to to school and they, the, there was a big focus upon the natural environment, wanting to see more trees and flowers planted and fewer trees being cut down and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, if you just click through there. Oh, sorry, no, sorry. This is this was the extra slide um, I, I put in. I, I, I confused myself here. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of designing the survey, um, this will come on a little bit later as well, but very, very important from the outset to try not to have open ended questions. What do you think? Because in those cases, you will get a multitude of answers and it's how you compile those answers at the end that really, really takes the time. So wherever possible, I really, really encourage anybody who's going to go through this route to have multiple choice questions because it's so much easier to compile at the at the end, um, you know, through an Excel spreadsheet and things like that. It's 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 a lot lot easier. Yeah, you can get maybe better qualitative results in terms of asking what people think. Um, but, and also, you do have to be a little bit careful of the responses that that you get. You know, we did have open ended questions. Um, there were you could tell even in the open ended questions that people had put in multiple answers, um, multiple responses. So there, there, were, there was certainly one person that, that, that I remember had put in about must have been over 10 responses because the, the, even though it had slightly changed every time you mentioned like with clad cyclists, you know, for some reason you had a Venus bonnet about like with clad cy cyclists. So, you know, Whilst you can't discount those, you know, making a point, um, you know, that, that's something you do need to be careful of, wary of. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, if you just click through this one a little bit um, until we get to the end. Yeah, 
Um, so the um, the staff survey. So we, we did a staff survey and we did um, an external public survey. So we had 502 responses to the staff survey. Um, really, really important issue for staff. Um, and the the you, the key sort of question was, you know, what should the council be doing? There, there was other questions, but the key one was, what should you know, what what, what should the council be doing? Um, the top of the list came. Uh, reduce the need for staff to travel and it's interesting actually since you know lockdown started um, you know the, the, what, what people were saying is you know look there was a really really inefficient system at the moment where people where, where, where why can't meetings be held virtually we've got the technology now why can't people why can't meetings be held be held virtually why do people have to come into county hall then to go all the way back out to go to a meeting somewhere else you know that there was you know, practical issues like that that were being highlighted so that was really really top top of the list maximize renewable energy generation new buildings to be very low or zero carbon and very close forth was the um existing buildings and um and improving the energy efficiency of our, of our existing bills and uh, next slide please and the county countywide survey um we had 523 responses on those. 52% um, thought the natural environment elements were of particular concern. Um, wanted us to do more woodland planting, peatland restoration, or wildflower planting. 50% um, of us wanted to reduce waste and increase the reuse, the reuse recycling, composting. 44% were interested in renewable energy resources. 44% uh, wanted you know to us to improve walking, cycling, and public transport. And 39% um, improve the energy efficiency of our buildings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, click on a little bit. Uh, yeah. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, following consultation, as, as I mentioned there before, there was a significant amount of work pulling together um, and analysing all the responses. Um, you know, this is where it got you know, you know a little bit silly in terms of the certainly the open-ended questions and um, trying to you know look at every which we did. You know, we looked at every single um, every single response um and and tried to you know pulling them into categories and, and 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 things like that so it was it, it was difficult it was time consuming um we then obviously had to refine the action plan and then decide how we em embedded or prioritized the results obviously what we thought were the key challenges were not necessarily what the public mentioned the you know the public you know um highlighted the natural environment as being as being key myself as a as a you know as a professional i i would have had other things as as a, as a priority um you know so you do have to take your own judgment into account in terms of what you put forward as you know the the, the key the priority messages, um, you know, it, it you've got to go for the you know the, the projects that have the biggest carbon bang for the buck, if you like, and tree planting isn't necessarily that. Um, and going on, going on from there, yeah, publicity and communications. Once you've started the process, you've got to then continue on, um, you know, using those using those channels. You tell people what you've done what the answers were um how you how you're going forward because stopping that communication you know can potentially do more harm than good uh, next slide please so in terms of um the impact that the consultation has had yes um we um trying to embed the climate emergencies in the council culture there's now um, a climate change expectation with all, within all job descriptions. There is a climate change um, climate change impacts are now mandatory on all reports. There's a, now a renewed and re-engaged leadership. Um, 
yes, there was significant tree planting promises made by our um, senior, um, uh, one of our senior members um, that promised um, a, a tree for every child in the count in the county. Um, problem was we didn't have necessarily the land to make to, to do those to carry out that. But you know we we, we are we are progressing. Um, there was extra funding secured for projects. Um, we 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 never we never necessarily had a problem accessing funds for for projects, um, but they always had to deliver savings within a twelve year payback period. Um, that's now been increased to uh, twenty years, so that that's been a real real bonus for us. Um, I think there's maybe a couple more there on that. Can you click on a little bit. Now anybody here is? Can you click on a little bit? Oh, coming up. There was, well, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, so there was, the, obviously, the, the new council target to 80%, um, which was um, which was declared. Um, there was, the our, we, we got a new director, um, which has the job title in neighbourhoods, and we've got a new the director for neighborhoods and climate change and um governance really important we are only just getting this sorted now um you know so if you can get it sorted before um you know before you go out to, the, to consultation brilliant because ours is only just getting sorted now and that's really really important next slide please a couple more to go sorry um wasn't worth it Yes, strengths, engagement, buy-in, support, transparency, key. Um, some new ideas, maybe converting skeptics and getting that leadership from from the from from staff. We've got an excellent um, member. Our our, our uh, climate champion is absolutely superb. Um, one of our councillors, you know, but actually engaging with senior management as well is 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 a different aspect. Um, so you need that buy-in from both members and senior management. Weaknesses, as I said, staff time, resource, maybe duplication and complication of uh, completion of results. How do you keep it engaged? How do you keep engaging? And last slide, please. Um, yeah, get help. Can't do it all yourself. Engage with your communications team. Um, engage with others. Um, you really, really can't do it yourself. Get your communications plan sorted from from day one. Um, get a sh do some short term detailed and funded actions. So you know, we, we, ours is our, our action plan is two years. Um, we've already delivered on some actions already. Um, so you know, even if it's just small scale street lighting, or you'll do, you know, fifty percent street lighting, or you will um, do. LED lights in your all your leisure centres or something like that. You know, short term, detail funded, critical, so you can show that actually you are achieving. And council culture and, and leadership is, is key. You know, it's raising awareness within the council. Um, and as I say, it's just it's broader than your service area. It's broader than the than our team. The count the the the, the um. The <laughs> Low carbon economy team. It's my dog. Um, it's broader than us. Um, it's housing solutions. It's transport. It is. Um, it, it's the tree officers. It's everybody. Everybody needs to engage with this. Thank you. Great, Thank you very much. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you from the top as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just a, a couple of things that, um, that we can raise and a couple of questions have, have come up. I think if we if we hold them and then we'll uh, hear from Denise and then come back to them uh, after Denise has spoken. So next up, Denise Ludlum from Derbyshire. Um, Denise, if you want to unmute un your microphone um, and uh, get going. 
Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for uh, asking me to talk about Derbyshire's work today. So I'm Denise Ludlam and I work for Derbyshire County Council as the Principal Policy Officer for Climate Change and Sustainability. And I'm here to uh, talk to you about some of the work we've do, been doing with engaging with the business communities across the county. Um, I'm going to talk about the journey that we've been on, which actually has very, very similar kind of process to that that uh, Stephen was talking about in Durham. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start by talking about what happened in May last year, so May 2019, um, and in response to requests to um, declare a climate emergency, which Derbyshire County Council didn't do, we actually produced a climate and carbon reduction manifesto. The manifesto contains 14 pledges and they cover all sorts of things. Um, so from uh, climate change to wider environmental issues, it touches on plastics. So it, it's not really just about climate change, it's about broader things. And I was really keen to make sure that that was the case because I don't think you can separate climate change out. So we wanted it to be a truly green Derbyshire. Um, one of the pledges in the Carbon and uh, Reduction Manifesto was that we would produce some targets and objectives within six months. So but pretty much by the end of 2019. So I had a very busy summer putting together two documents. One was the Derbyshire County Council Carbon Reduction Plan. Um, this was taken to Cabinet in 2019 and this sets out how we can get our internal emissions to net zero by 2032. The other document is the one that's more relevant to what I'm going to talk about today and that is the Derbyshire Environment and Climate Change Framework which was approved at the same Cabinet meeting in November 2019. Um, this document sets out a common approach for all local authorities across the county to reduce area-wide emissions to net zero by 2050 in line with the Paris Agreement. It doesn't have any detail in it, it just talks about what we need to do. Uh, next slide please. So when we were producing the environment and, and climate change framework, we looked at the science that was around at the time and we used the Tyndall budgets, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And we looked at what we actually needed to do to get to net zero by 2050. And the graph on the bottom um, right hand side of the page, I'm sure you're all familiar with this curve. I don't think you even need to see the detail. It tells us that we've got to reduce our area wide emissions very, very steeply over the next 10 years if we're going to stick within that Paris Agreement. And we were very keen to make sure that what we did would, would limit our part um, in, in sticking to that two degrees global temperature rise, so, which is really very much a challenge. So we started working with the other local planning authorities in Derbyshire. So we've got eight district and boroughs as a city council and we have a national park, which is also a planning authority. And we talked about how we would need to uh, reduce emissions and what areas of work we would need to reduce those emissions in. And we came up with this framework, which has several different areas. So energy, travel, resources, air quality, the economy, the natural environment and partnership working as well, including planning. Um, and all those areas, the idea is that we will produce um, strategies or, or, or plans that will reduce emissions in each of those areas and that will play a part in those Derbyshire wide carbon budgets. <clears throat> so following this modelling, we've got a better understanding of what we actually need to do to reduce emissions across the county. So this was November 2019. Um, 
because of this work, it became very apparent that Derbyshire County Council and the other local planning authorities couldn't do this on, on their own, that we needed a county wide approach to this and we needed to involve all a full range of different people. Next slide, please. And we looked at who we needed to involve. And, and this list was just endless. And the list on the left of that slide is the districts, boroughs, Derby City, the Peak National Park, health organisations, businesses, public sector organisations, the agricultural community, parish and town councils, environment groups, youth groups, Mrs Jones who lives down the road. The list just went on and on and on. And the size of the font in that slide doesn't reflect the importance of those. It's just the fact that the list just goes on and on and on. We were keen to have some immediate action. Our elected members were keen to see some actual action very quickly on the ground. Um, and we thought about who we could engage with quickly and effectively and meaningfully. And given what we've already heard about community consultation, a kind of wider community consultation wasn't going to happen overnight. So we considered all the groups that we worked with um, and, and eventually decided that we would put on an event and we would engage with our local businesses. And the reasons we did that, we thought, well, we're already engaging our local businesses through a, a decarbonise grant scheme. And this is a grant scheme that's got EU funding uh, where we work with businesses to implement um, energy efficiency measures or energy renewable energy generation schemes and even to look at research to develop low carbon products. So that's been a really successful scheme. We'd also worked with businesses on our low emission vehicle infrastructure strategy because we'd wanted to know how we could um, get that infrastructure for low, uh, low emission vehicles correct and how we could encourage businesses to invest in low emission vehicles. We'd also work with the University of Derby on their low carbon business network. So we were aware that there was a large number of businesses who were really keen to take action on the environment. So this seemed a natural area for focus given the time scale involved. Um, so we decided to put on an event. The event um, was on the 3rd of March this year, so it was literally just before lockdown and Covid was around, but we hadn't actually gone into lockdown. But I think it did affect how we ran it, but not greatly. But it was certainly um, an interesting factor and I think things have definitely moved on in ways we couldn't possibly have imagined uh, since then. Next slide, please. We spent an awful long time thinking about the aims and objectives for this event um, and we really wanted the emphasis to be on what the businesses could do to reduce county wide emissions. We definitely wanted it about how it would benefit our local economy. So there's really important points about the low carbon economy and actually how climate action is good for the economy. It's not a, a nice add on. It's not a sort of a nice bit of greenwash that you do. It's good for the economy. It's good for your purse. Um, the, the low carbon economy is growing. So there's definitely a, a strong angle there. So our overall aim after much deliberation uh, was to explore the challenge of how you, i.e. the businesses, can help deliver the Derbyshire environment, environment and climate change framework to achieve a net zero carbon Derbyshire by 2050. So right from the start, we were up front. This is not about what Derbyshire County Council is going to do for you. It's about what you can do for your county. And I think that was a really important approach from my point of view anyway. And then we had several um, objectives. So by the end, we said to the businesses that by the end of the event, you will have learnt about Derbyshire's ambition to be a net zero carbon county by 2050. So we needed to explain to them what that meant and the, the, a very brief awareness about climate change and the implications of climate change and if, what happens if we don't get to net zero by 2050. Um, 
You will have been inspired and challenged by a range of low carbon initiatives from across the county. So we set out to introduce and, and, and share lots of different um, actions and events and things that were going on across the county that have already been successful. And then we wanted to explore ways that your organisation can support the climate change agenda in Derbyshire. And finally, uh, and last but it's definitely not least, you will have had a chance to meet and network with others committed to responding to the challenge of carbon reduction. And that networking was a really important part of the whole event and continues to be so. Next slide, please. We also made two further requests of businesses that came to our event. Um, and again, we thought really deeply about this and we had lots of discussions about whether these were the right things to ask. So we asked businesses uh, throughout the event to make a commitment. So we asked them, what does your organisation commit to doing to help Derbyshire achieve net zero carbon by 2050? So we wanted to encourage businesses to sort of declare where they were going and their intentions moving forward. And I think that's been quite powerful um, in how businesses have, have thought about their way forward. And I think COVID has probably affected that as well. So, and then the second request we had of them was, what do we, Derbyshire County Council, need to do to help your organisation meet its commitment? And there was a great deal of controversy, really, in, in being so open and asking, what do you want us to do? Because we were quite worried that we would be maybe asked to do all sorts of things that we probably couldn't commit to. In the event, it, it, you know, we shouldn't have worried about that. People were very sensible and the asks were entirely understandable and entirely within our gift, really. So I think that's been a really positive thing to come out of, of that. Next slide, please. So we held our event on the 3rd of March. It was an all day event. Um, we provided lunch and refreshments throughout the day. Um, we met people at the train and bus station in our electric cars and gave them a courtesy lift up to the event. Um, and we had also employed a, an organisation that was able to provide us with a smartphone app for the day. And that app allowed people to submit questions, make their commitments, network with each other and meet each other. So it was a kind of all singing, all dancing. And it was something a bit new for Derbyshire County Council. And it was quite nerve wracking, but it did work extremely well. So the day itself was really successful. We had loads of media attention uh, and there was a real buzz about the place. And that was the one thing that people mentioned was what a, a buzz it was. The whole day was buzzing with enthusiasm. And I think that's a real success. So we had um, 24 marketplace exhibitors. So we had a room set up where uh, businesses could kind of talk about the low carbon things they were doing and that might be a product, it might be an approach they were doing, have they taken advantage of LED lighting or solar electricity. So there were all sorts of things and that was heaving at every opportunity. People were very busy in there. The event was attended by 232 delegates from 89 organisations. Uh, we had 14 presentations, which I'll talk about very briefly in a minute. And then at the end, by the end of the event, we'd got 32 commitments to doing certain things to reduce uh, businesses impact on the environment. And we had 29 asks of Derbyshire County Council. So there's a lot going on throughout the entire day. Next slide, please. There were times when we um, just had one session with everybody together and then there were times when there were two sessions running sort of concurrently so that delegates could attend whichever theme interested them. But the topics that we discussed um, and had presentations from at the event were the low carbon economy, um, energy generation and use, developing the circular economy, changing business culture, low emission travel, 
natural capital using the planning system and thoughts from the next next generation. So we decided that we couldn't possibly hold an event like this without inviting some of the some young people on to contribute their thoughts about the low carbon economy moving forward. Um, and the two people that we invited, I think, really stole the show because they were very eloquent, very knowledgeable and very clear about where they thought the low carbon economy in Derbyshire should go. And I probably don't need to tell you what they said. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, I've just sort of put together five things that I think we learnt from that tackling climate change together. Um, the first is that businesses and organisations across Derbyshire recognise the need to work together to tackle climate change effectively. And for me, this was really important that that businesses and organisations didn't think for one minute it was Derbyshire County Council's responsibility to tackle climate change. It was that we all actually, we do need to work together to do this. Otherwise, we won't achieve a positive outcome. Um, the second thing was Derbyshire's public sector authorities are committed to the net zero carbon uh, by 2050 target. We um, actually, at the event, we had one of those lovely um, signing ceremonies where we got a great big declaration and leaders and chief execs of local planning authorities signed their commitment to that. But again, while that's very much a gesture, it, it, it's an indication that it's not just Derbyshire County Council, all local authorities are committed to that. And I think that gave um, some um, confidence to the businesses that actually we were travelling in a certain direction. Uh, we also learned that businesses around Derbyshire are already reducing their emissions through a huge range of actions from, from transport, energy, their processes and products. There was an awful lot already going on and that the businesses are committed to further action uh, going forward. Also, it was very clear from that event that all the businesses realised that actually reducing emissions is good for business and good for people. So there was lots of really useful information there and it was it's given confidence to move forward in a direction. Uh, next slide, please. So in my last slide, um, it, it's what happens now. And I, I, I will say that I think we've been very slow in the follow up and I think that's been necessary because because of COVID things have got delayed. So we did say we would do follow up within six months um, and we haven't. Um, it's on my to do list, but um, I have. I'm about to send out a, uh, a newsletter with a questionnaire. So the questionnaire is going to sort of follow up, you know, um, what have you done since then? Has it changed? What are your intentions? All sorts of things to follow up from that. And we've decided we're going to produce a quarterly newsletter. But when I say a newsletter, it's going to be more of a series of bullet points about things that are happening elsewhere. So where to go for more information, grant funding, uh, trusted trader things that are happening and so on. Um, we hope to be launching a green entrepreneur grant scheme in the new year, uh, sort of possibly might end up being the new financial of the year, but within the next few months. And that will help people that want to develop green businesses. Um, and uh, we have seen this huge amount of engagement between the different groups and businesses of, that, that attended that of, event. So there's been lots of sharing of information and different events that have actually happened in the world of business and climate change and low carbon economy have attracted lots and lots of interest. So it does feel like there's a really positive um, message out there. So I feel very, very positive for the low carbon economy in Derbyshire. Um, and that's me done. Thank you very much. Great, Denise, ideal. Um, lots of um, ideas there, lots of questions that I've got. I think um, there's been a few questions and comments coming up as we've been going along. So I'll to Charlotte to Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so I'll just run through um, a few of the questions. But firstly, a big thank you really from all of us for uh, all the speakers today. It was really great to hear um, from Davey the findings of the report in such a clear and succinct way. Um, and also fantastic to hear what's going on in these two uh, councils in terms of engagement um, from the Durham perspective, in particular, to see such varied channels of engagement. Um, and you'd highlighted the, the link between sort of the rural and, and, and urban differences across uh, across the county. So, you know, really great to hear that. And also some fantastic tips for other people for delivering uh, uh, surveys. Um, and also, I think we've highlighted it before in, in Apsi Things, but I just think it's amazing that at Durham you've got that built into all job descriptions that climate change is, uh, is a commitment for all uh, for all new staff. It really highlights that idea that it isn't just, you know, the, the responsibility of a small team, it really is a whole council-wide uh, area to be focused on. Um, so again, great that you've, uh, that you've highlighted that in the presentation today. Um, and also from um, the Derbyshire perspective, really fantastic to hear that uh, Green Derbyshire approach um, and the way that you've, you've sort of looked a little bit differently at the, at the area and included the plastic and ecological uh, implications as well. Um, and also fantastic to hear about the great work that you've been doing with businesses um, and that event sounded fantastic and the use of the app and I really liked the idea of you picking everybody up from the uh, train station in your electric cars um, I bet that was uh, I bet that was uh, really great so again thank you um, to everybody for speaking today um, so I'm just going to run through a few questions in the chat so I've written them down up until the presentation's finished um, so I'm going to go through those first um, and then if anyone's been putting any in in the last couple of minutes just bear with me on those because I'll have to read through them um, but a few of the earlier ones that appeared we'll, uh, we'll get going with first um, so firstly, there was one for Davy, um, which is, uh, could you possibly share any examples of how minority and vulnerable groups uh, might be disproportionately affected by climate change? Um, so I know Sheena from the Constitution Institute shared a link in the chat um, as well. But I don't know if you've got anything to add on that one, Davy. Oh, I think you muted still. Sorry. <laughs> I think you still mute. Oh, yeah, there you go. Good. Sorry about that. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, in some ways, you know, climate change is a bit similar to COVID-19. I mean, there's been a lot of work done on how minority groups or certain groups are disproportionately affected by COVID. And it's not dissimilar in relation to climate change. There's been a lot of work by the United Nations on the disproportionate effect on the global south of climate change, that most of the emissions uh, climate emissions are caused by the north and most of the people who are really suffering the most at the moment are in the global south for example bringing it back to home here you're talking about people with lower incomes tend to be great greatly uh, affected by climate change tenants tend to live in worse worse insulated accommodation um, lower income groups tend to live closer to main roads and get more of the air pollution young people and older people tend to be most affected by air pollution you're talking about, about black and minority ethnic communities tending to live in areas which are less leafy with better uh, uh, and, and with worse uh, uh, housing conditions and so on all the things that we know about in relation to uh, equalities groups in general are, are true also in relation to, to climate change and I think that's something which we have to be very aware of um, as well as the link that, that uh, Sheena put into the the chat if, I mean I just typed you know into Google while we were while we were having the, those great presentations from Durham and Derbyshire and uh, you know there's a raft of stuff in there if you want if you don't if you don't believe me uh, there's a really good report from the Joseph Roundtree Trust from a few years ago for example on climate justice there's even an organization called climate justice which exists on, on on this area specifically to highlight these differences so there's a lot of information out there and it's well worth familiarizing yourself with it Great, thank you, David. Yeah, really, really important to be uh, to be aware of all of that. So, thank you. Um, so, there's a question from Gwen for Stephen, um, which is, do you have regular communication with staff on climate change issues? Um, yeah, we we do. We we, we did have um, uh, Eco Champions um, set up, which we we actually set up in about 2014, something like that. Um, it went off the boil somewhat um, over the last sort of a uh, few years, but we've just sort of um, at the start of the climate emergency, we we we, we re-engaged that. We've rebranded them as climate champions now, and yes, yeah, so we've got um, 
Uh, we've got about 100 climate champions right across the authority. We've got, as I mentioned, we've got our uh, one of our members, um, Councillor John Clare, who's talked before at APSI, um, who is who's a brilliant advocate, brilliant public speaker. Um, you know, he, he's our he's our chief climate champion, if you like. Uh, but yeah, lots of staff from lots of different directorates um, are involved and are engaged. So, so yeah, um, it, it is important. Obviously, we the, the action plan which I which I've shared in in the chat. Um, you you'll see there that you know it's not just us. It is you know as I mentioned in the presentation. You know, it, it's it there are, there are actions for staff right across the authority in lots of different uh, departments and services. Um, you know, so we, we we it's our role to compile all that information and report back you know but as i say as i mentioned it's it, it's it's n it's not the responsibility of the low carbon team to achieve these targets it is the responsibility of the council as a whole to achieve these targets great thank you very much Stephen. Um, a few people have also asked um, julie and claire um about if it's possible to share any further results um and possibly share the climate change impact assessment framework. Um, I think I've seen a couple of answers on the chat. You've, you've posted the, the link to the report and you said Appendix B shows some of the results in more detail. Um, if there's anything that you're happy for us to circulate, um, instead of sort of, you know, exchanging email addresses and sending yeah. one one, we're happy to send it out with all of the post event uh, links. So if you are happy to share any of those sort of further reports, um, then please just send them through to the list and uh, we can get them circulated across the group. Thank you. Um, and Julie's also asked, how did you find enough land to plant trees? <laughs> you mentioned it was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, it, 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 it is, it is. Um, I think I think this has been an ongoing issue with tree planting for a long, long time. I remember seeing a report on Country File, I think a couple of years ago, um, that, 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 you know, that had, you know, that, that highlighted a lot of these issues. So we, we were lucky when, when we declared the climate emergency. Um, one of the um, we, we got 1.5 million um, to spend on climate change projects, specifically on sort of real carbon reduction projects, and and some of that money was taken by our uh, woodland our woodland team, um, and they are funding an officer um, that is trying to identify areas of land that we can plant trees on. Now we. We've obviously got our own areas of land, um, you know, but they've got sort of competing priorities as well. So they're, they're working with landowners and we've got some, you know, um, you know, lots of various landowners, um, you know, and, 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 but we've also got the an area of outstanding natural beauty in, 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 um, in our in our county, which, you know, is managed for heather um you know head and 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 grouse and things like that um so it, it it's finding it's finding appropriate areas you know where you know tree planting in the wrong place can be can be more damaging you know if it's if you're tree planting on peatland for example um so it's got to be the appropriate case so we've employed somebody that's going to um help get those areas where, where are the, the most appropriate areas of land. Thanks Stephen, I think it's also important, you know, there's that side of it, but also the maintaining of those trees and making sure those yep. plans are in place to maintain them as well can, uh, can also be a challenge that, that councils can come across. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, and Claire has also asked to Stephen, um, how well received was the change in target? Um, by us actually pretty well. We we always thought the 60% target was, you know, very low. Um, we, we, we were, I mean, at the moment we are at 51% um, 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 away from our target. That's based on a 2008-9 baseline. That's the, the council target. So at 51%, so always thought 60% by 2030 was would be fine. 80% um, is challenging. Um, we, we've we've set that target, um, so um, we, we've set our goals and where we need to be be to. And in 1920, we were a thousand tons off where we need to be. So we're already behind. Make no bones about it. It's 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 going to be tough. Yeah, the, the, this year will 
you know we can probably count as a bit of an anomaly um, when we get when we get you know the 2021 data, um, you know, but it it eight percent is is a challenge, um, and we're not including any carbon offsetting within that. You know, there's no carbon offsetting. This is purely from energy efficiency works. Um, you know, and I saw some something in the team chat. Where, you know, you do really need to be careful about the terminology. Was absolutely, you know, net zero. You know, what 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 does it include? You know, does it include, you know, offsetting and things like that? So our eight percent doesn't include any carbon offsetting. So yeah, good. You know, for, from our perspective, yeah, eight percent is much more testing. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Um, and there's been another question which um, a few people have answered and given some great insight in the chat, um, but I'm going to come to all speakers on it um, in the order that you presented in. Um, so the question is, are there any other good alternatives to host, hosting large workshops while COVID um, is a thing? Um, so I know a few people, as I mentioned, have put in the chat um, an online survey from Wokingham um, and also Nottingham, um, Michael from Nottingham has shared um, some also some good uh, information in the chat. Um, so do go and have a look at that. But I'll come to Davey on it first um, and then Steve and then Denise. Yeah, I mean, it, it's perfectly possible to do some serious and interesting work online. I mean, we've been doing this not just on the issue of climate change, but also on COVID-19 and on other issues at the Institute. And certainly people want sort of, sort of some help on that. We can offer that. We've got some people who are quite expert on doing this online consultation and engagement work. Um, I, I think for some people actually prefer to do this this online. You know, not everybody wants to come to public meetings. You know, I mean, oddly enough, I mean, I know we're probably all the sort of people who show up at public meetings all the time. But there are lots of people who don't really like them. And, and we, we certainly we found in some instances that you can get a greater and more interesting engagement with people online. So, yeah, I, I think it's perfectly feasible to do this. And, and if you need any help, we can help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you go to a public meeting, you you know, a, a two hour public meeting or, you know, it, it, it ends up taking up, you know, you know, a half a day or, or or whatever. You know, we used to have you know two hour meetings of the of the renewable energy, absolutely renewable energy group. You know, which you, you know, if it was down in Manchester, it would be you know a full day. Um, you know, so it, it, two hours online is a lot more manageable. So uh, absolutely, we have specific Teams channels for our climate champions. Um, you know, which, which which we've set up um, a lot better than you know sending out um you know email upon email upon email. And, and and that that's actually a key point you know overload of messaging can is an issue um you know we we were sending out emails um and there's some people got a little bit sick of the frequency <laughs> um you know so um over, so we, we switched to a specific teams channel so now people can dip into that they'll get a notification that somebody's um post something on there, um, but they're not being inundated with emails all the time. So I think, you know, picking and choosing your communication, um, your, your, your communication route is is, um, is sensible. Thank you, and Denise. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've got two points, really, um, and I'd, I'd agree with the last two speakers. The first was that we were due to hold another event in October on low carbon housing and that was due to be a face to face event and that was all planned and so on. But we actually moved that online and it proved just as successful to do that event online. Um, I think there was some networking and some of the buzz was missing, but I think it was just as effective. And, and we had over 100 people to that event and lots of positive outcomes to it. But I think the second part of my answer is I think we also need to be as professionals. I think we need to be more um, imaginative about how we get messages out there. And I think we need to mainstream climate action and in, in, in terms of using a full range of media channels, because it's really easy now, isn't it? To just go, we'll have a Zoom meeting or, or whatever. Um, and I think everybody's a bit zoomed out, but I think we need to be more imaginative. Um, it, it might be about what products are in shops. It might be about having uh, electric vehicles that are liveried so that people can see them. So it becomes their part of the background and it's not unusual. It's not kind of, you know, it's not just a certain group. It's mainstream. So, yeah, 
I don't know. Perfect. Okay. No, thank you very much. Um, and Kevin has also shared in the chat, Kevin Frey, that um, our people's jewellery went online halfway through. Uh, it took some work to equip everyone with the necessary equipment and skills to ensure equal access, but it was fine online and in person are both valuable and effective. Um, so yeah, just sort of echoing the, the points that you've made. Um, so thank you very much for all of your questions um, and to the speakers for all of your answers. Um, I'm just going to hand back to Phil, we've got about three minutes left. Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, I've just got a couple of points I wanted to, to raise really. First of all, Denise, you, you know you, you mentioned there were 20, uh, 32 commitments and 29 asks of the council. Were they kind of publicised as a report about those they monitored or? Yes, they are um, all on uh, on our website. So I can send you a link through um, that you can that. Yeah, you're welcome to send out. Yes, yeah, so we, we publish quite a lot of post event stuff in a very simple sort of way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. no, it should be good to, to see the output, I suppose. And, and also, what can, what level of person you know, turns up? I think I spoke when I spoke to you. You said there were some big organisations. You know, what kind of seniority will it be for attending? Yeah, yeah, we had we had the full range actually. So we had a couple of um, I'm not quite sure of his actual title, but the head honcho of Toy Toyota uh, in um, in the UK. I'm not quite sure what his actual title is off the top of my head. I would have to look that up. But Toyota are very committed to to a low carbon future um so and and they are based in derbyshire so that's really important so they he was one of our keynote speakers um long cliff we had the again i don't know if they're ceos or what and I, I can't remember but the head honcho from long cliff quarry which is one of the very very big quarries in our area and he was representing the basically the sort of the minerals uh, sector so we did have kind of at that level of people, very influential people, you know, people that got clout. And I think that was really important to have those. Yeah, yeah, great, nice one, okay. Right, um, so just uh, just to say, uh, you know, time's up. I think, um, you know, I've certainly, I've certainly learned a lot, I hope everybody else, I hope everybody else has. Special uh, thanks to, to Stephen and Denise there for taking the time to prepare and come along, uh, very helpful. Again, saying to Davey and the, his colleagues at the Consultation Institute, watch out for the document uh, that's coming out, as I say, it'll be out in about a week's time. Anything you want to you want to finish with, Davey? Any comments you want to make? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it, it, it sounds a bit dramatic, but, you know, the United Nations tells us that climate change is the greatest issue facing humanity. And I think engaging the public on how to tackle the climate emergency is the greatest public engagement challenge over the next 10, 15 years as well. So, you know, we can all contribute to that and we all have to learn from each other's experience on that and work together to try to spread good practice on this. Because if we don't do this properly, um, we're not going to tackle climate change effectively unless we take the public with us. So uh, this is in, this is not sort of special pleading. This is genuinely the case that this is the biggest challenge that we face on public engagement for the next 10 years. Okay, wise words, Debbie, thank you very much. Um, right, well, just to say, we're going to be staying on uh, online for the next few minutes. If anybody's got any questions that they, they want to raise with us, uh, keep your eyes open for our next webinar, which is on electric vehicles on the 19th of January. And remember, we're open to, uh, to ideas about other topics. Um, Based on uh, what's over Denise's left shoulder, I suppose I should say Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, well done for that prompt. <laughs> Other than that, um, thanks very much for, for taking your time and, and attending, and uh, goodbye from us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.